Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, then you know just say in the in the chat. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for for coming to to what should be uh, an excellent event. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to quick, quickly kind of introduce some of the the groups co-sponsoring uh, this talk. Uh, people who've kind of worked really hard to to make this happen. Uh, so. Firstly, there's a radical guide, uh, which is just that. It's a, you know, a guide that offers historical and current locations, people, and places of interest that highlight the wonderful world of resistance, uh, resistance in the spirit of creating a better world for all uh, that is not rooted in capitalism, competition, and hierarchy, and you know, the radical spirit. Um, also, uh, the Anthropology and Social Change Department at the California Institute of Integral Studies um, is uh, is uh, an institute that teaches activist research an integral relationship that transforms both the researcher and the community into active participants in producing knowledge and in transforming themselves. Uh, and they are co-publishers with PM Press uh, of the uh, the book uh, that James Kelman uh, has, has uh, produced with Noam Chomsky. Between thought and expression lies a lifetime. Um, uh, and PM is uh, an independent radical publisher of books and media, uh, yeah, sorry, is an independent radical publisher of books and media to arm dreamers to demand the impossible. Um, and of course, lastly, there's Working Class History, and which is a, a, project, a project that aims to popularize history of struggle uh, from below through our podcast, which is available by pretty much any and all podcast apps. Um, and you can also find us on most social media platforms for kind of on this day content. Uh, and we're also starting to branch out into videos on YouTube and TikTok. Um, so I'm sure that, you know, you all know very well who our guests are today, but basically the conventions of the forum state that I should give them uh, an introduction. Uh, so James Kelman is a Scottish novelist, a short story writer, a playwright, an essayist whose many literary awards include the Booker Prize, uh, and the James Tate Black Prize. Um, he's been called uh, the greatest British novelist of our time, uh, and his new novel, uh, God's Teeth and Other Phenomena, is uh, forthcoming from PM Press in 2022. Um, Noam Chomsky is a laureate professor at the University of Arizona and professor emeritus in the, um, in the MIT Department of Linguistics and Philosophy. His work is widely credited with having revolutionized the field of modern linguistics. And not content with that, Chomsky is also uh, one of the foremost critics of US foreign policy. Uh, he's published numerous groundbreaking books, articles, and essays on global politics, history, and linguistics. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to send my best wishes to, to Noam as uh, it's his birthday tomorrow. So I'm sure everyone in the chat, if you want to say, uh, happy birthday to, to Noam Chomsky, do, do feel free. Um, so, I, I'm, you know, I realize we're running late, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief uh, on my end, because um, I think we want to get, uh, you know, get into speaking to our guests. Um, but so for today's event, for, so for today's event, uh, Jim is going to be giving us a reading from the book, and this is going to be followed by a discussion between James, uh, between James and Noam. Uh, and finally, there's going to be a Q&A at the end, uh, and you can submit your questions via the chat um, on your respective social media platforms. Uh, but as questions are going to be pulled uh, at a specific time during the broadcast, do please hold your questions uh, till the Q&A itself. Um, though obviously, you know, do feel free to leave comments and reactions uh, at any time during the broadcast. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. I think apart from just saying, you know, I'm really pleased and really excited to, to be here at this event. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, uh, Jim, would you like to uh, to start us off with your reading? This was a, this was an introduction that I, I gave back in 1990 at the self determination event, uh, where uh, Noam uh, Chomsky was giving the keynote address. So this was the introduction. That I gave. Noam Chomsky is not only a major Western philosopher, he's a major thinker of the left. In one way or another, he spent most of his life in the struggle against oppression and against greed. 
There are at least three things I see to put him out on a limb. One, in philosophical terms, he believes there are certain kinds of knowledge available to folk right at birth, before they've had any experience gained from living in the actual world. This seems the most comprehensive way of explaining how it is we're able to know and understand things in the way that we do. Two, as a committed thinker of the left, he insists in discussing politics at almost every opportunity, not only in conversation, but on the page. It is likely to publish an article in the secretive and murderous affairs of state, as he is to publish an essay in philosophy or aspects of transformational grammar. The third reason Noam can be considered subversive has to do with the dissemination of knowledge. The tremendous range of work he does in spreading information, just th getting things known to the public at large. It's central to his thesis that everybody can know. There is no body of theory or significant body of relevant information beyond the comprehension of the layperson that makes policy immune from criticism. Unless we are mentally ill or in some other way more disadvantaged, all of us have the analytic skills and intelligence to attempt an understanding of the world. The skills demanded of an elderly person playing several hands of bingo. The skills demanded of a single parent to get to the supermarket and do a weekly shopping and a limited budget for a large family of young kids. All of these skills are there to be developed and applied to any subject whatsoever, including subjects like a country's foreign policy or the correlation between cuts in welfare and infant mortality, between cuts in welfare and suicide, cuts in welfare and drug abuse, alcohol abuse, prostitution, madness. No one should have any illusions about how political this can be, just spreading information. It's probably the basic premise in most countries of the world that everybody cannot know. Once you finish school, college or university, you're encouraged to stop learning, to stop finding things out. You're trained to leave intellectual matters to the experts. Even existence itself, you're trained to leave the living of your life to those who specialize in such concepts. The folk who are paid by the state, they won't live your life for you, but they'll determine how it should be lived. They'll let you know what's possible and what isn't possible. Similar to the situation of being a child in society, it's appropriate here, parent is expert. But so too is the situation of a group or class or an entire race of people under domination or colonization, external or internal. Folk who cannot determine their own existence, they're in thrall. The right to self-determination has been taken from them and it's kept from them often by force, by the calculated violence of those in power. We should remember that at that self-determination event 30 years ago, there were people whose commitment to social change has meant they've been imprisoned and they've had to face various degrees of harassment and personal danger, even just to get to the actual event. There were people with us who were unable to raise their family within the traditions and customs of their own culture. There were people here on that first morning who cannot even live in their own country. Professor Chomsky is wary of links being made between his work on the philosophies of mind and language and his work in politics, and he gives good grounds for that. As he said in a recent interview, Obviously, one cannot infer anything about politics from what you know about universal grammar 
or controversy. But at the same time, there is something implicit in the very fact of our existence as human beings. And that is freedom and a right to self-determination, the right to not be tortured, the right to not be raped, the right to not be violated, the right to not be colonized in any way whatsoever. And from my own reading of Noam's work, that is his position. And either we do battle on that principle of freedom or we don't. That'll do for uh, the opening. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I could just say that part of why I began the big long essay in the first place was because I tried to bridge that gap from what from what Norm had said, I tried to indicate in ways that, that there could be an inference in terms of a, a, a political inference from the idea, uh, you know, going back to the, the that common sense tradition of philosophy, where you might say the core belief derived from that idea that uh, of, of the inviolability of all human beings and the uniqueness because of that, the basic premise as it is in, to some extent, I would mean, say every extent, is empathy and solidarity. That's what I see as being an inference from various technical points. So I'll say that to kick off. Yeah, I mean, like one, and I suppose this kind of relates to sort of one of the things that I found in reading this, uh, this book is that there's a sort of um a, like a, a, a multidisciplinarity or a kind of I mean, what i guess i think what you you call it a, like a generalist approach uh to to education to to knowledge that and that really kind of comes through that there's a kind of you know you're working simultaneously with like philosophy politics and then even kind of branching out to the you know mathematics and science and then art literature um and you know, I think there's, um, you know, you you kind of make those links between between Chomsky's various kind of branches of, of work. And it seems to me that, you know, it, it's important for you to weave these various threads together. And it's more than just kind of a, like a uh, like a general kind of interest. It seems that there's a, like an ethical or political concern there. Uh, and I, I was wondering, maybe could you talk about kind of why you kind of feel it's important to pull those various kind of trends, various kind of also various threads together like that. You want me to come in? Uh, should I come in there? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Well, one one of the things about it is simply it's, it's these aspects of uh, of uh, Noam's work or your work, Noam, the the sense that uh, everyone everyone uh, has the the capacity uh, to know, to learn, and to and to be uh, critical of of policy and so on. Uh, there are these uh, essential essential uh, elements to what it is to be a human being. And part of what was going on that I had I, I had been aware of is that the spread of education in this way can coincide with with movements against the existing order. Uh, this this was a case in maybe 18th century or uh, early 19th century uh, in my own country where there was things happening at that time where the development of education that way coincided with people attempting to change uh, or the deter to determine their own existence uh, meant and uh, eventually that we're having to take on uh, the state in some way or another. So I tried to kind of uh, uh, link in, uh, or try to show how these, these things may uh, go together. That was part of part of the original, uh, I suppose, motivation I had in, in starting work on on Noam's work and trying to uh, draw into the, Scot the common sense of Western philosophy as it applied in Scotland. I mean, that's a bit of a ramble, but it's the best I can do. Just now. no one was there any, anything that 
that you can come back on there or want to see from there? What I should? Well, I'm listening with great interest to the dialogue. I'd like to thank a lot of the people in the chat for their greetings. Uh, of the various things you discussed, uh, what, let's start with why ideas matter. That's like asking, why do human beings matter? Uh, if we go back to the earliest records that we have, uh, classical Greece, 2,500 years ago, the priestess at the Delphic Oracle uh, issued a kind of a declaration, whether this is myth or not, we don't know, but take it to be real. Uh, the injunction was know thyself. I think that's what links everything together and also answers why ideas matter. So when we ask uh, this aphorism, know thyself, was intended individually, you should understand yourself in Socratic terms and examine life, an unexamined life is not worth living. So it's an individual injunction. But it makes a lot more sense to interpret it collectively. But the reason is that uh, humans are remarkable for two reasons. One is humans are very much alike. There's very little biological diversity among humans. Uh, biologists tell us that if you find a small troop of monkeys somewhere, uh, they will probably have more genetic diversity among them than the entire human race. Uh, we're a species that emerged very suddenly, very recently, a couple hundred thousand years ago, blink of an eye in evolutionary time. Uh, and to know ourselves is to find out what is special about human beings, all of us. If we look closely, one of the things is having ideas like I have some delightful creatures uh, waiting calmly under my desk for when I'll be done with all this nonsense so I can, don't want to use the words, but can extricate them to the outdoors. Uh, but they have maybe, they have some things in their mind which we might call ideas, maybe a dozen of them. Humans are different. We have an infinite number of them. Uh, a lot of them we can't, we find it hard even to access. It takes special talent, special work, and much of our life is devoted to trying to access these ideas in our mind and to use them. And that makes uh, and this is done through language. In fact, if we ask. What are the distinctive features of human beings? The two that we find are language and thought. And if we look closely, we see that they're basically identical. Actually, this was recognized uh, at about the same time as the Delphic Oracle in the early days of the rich uh, Indian tradition uh, of, uh, I mean, India and South Asia. Indian tradition. We have a record of it, a rich record of philosophy, science, uh, thought. Uh, and 2,500 years ago, the leading, some of the founders of this tradition simply identified thought and language. Thought is the model, means of, uh, language is the means of forming, constructing thought. Thought is what is generated by language. Uh, these are basically the core of our nature, distinguish us radically from any other organism. There's nothing, when you look at the, more carefully at the nature of these systems, there aren't even any analogs in other organisms. So 
So something strange and amazing happened about 200,000 years ago. But these capacities haven't changed since. We have strong evidence for that. Uh, humans began separating from one another about 150,000 years ago. We have genomic evidence to show that at, at least that far, which is not long after Homo sapiens emerged. And there's been no change since. They all have the language faculty, same one, same faculty of thinking. You can pick up an infant in uh, Papua New Guinea and an uncontacted tribe, which hasn't had contact with other humans for 40,000 years. I bring it up in uh, Glasgow. It'll be like a normal kid from Glasgow can go on to the university and become a quantum physicist. And conversely, the rich, complex skills and abilities that you find in pre-technological societies are things that I could manage. I've seen them and could possibly do them. But if, if I'd grown up there, it would be as natural to me as uh, talking about these topics. So humans seem to be basically identical. And they have these astonishing capacities. I should say that throughout intellectual history, there has been continual amazement expressed at these capacities and rightly. So we go to the origins of the scientific revolution in the West in Europe, 17th century. Uh, Galileo and his uh, associates were completely reconstructing scientific inquiry in a new manner, scientific revolution. And uh, language didn't es escape their attention. Galileo, his contemporaries, were amazed and awed at what they regarded correctly as a remarkable fact that with a couple of dozen symbols, we can construct infinitely many thoughts. And even beyond that, we can find ways to convey to others the innermost workings of our mind, even though they have no access to our mind. And for this reason, uh, Galileo regarded the alphabet as the most spectacular invention in human history, because it was able to implement these uh, astonishing capacities. Well, that's humans. And if we look more turning to links, if we look more closely, we find several distinct facets of these human capacities. We can illustrate them by a day which is seared in my personal memory. Uh, a remarkable day in human history, August 6th, 1945, which revealed to us that hum one aspect of human intelligence had risen to the level where it was a it had found means to destroy everything. It hadn't quite reached that point yet, but it was clear that what was opened up on that day would lead soon to that point. In fact, it did a few years later with thermonuclear weapons. So that's one aspect of human capacity. Another aspect is our moral capacity. Do we have the moral capacity to control the demons that our intellectual capacity has created? The verdict on that is not very encouraging. If you look through the record of 75 years of uh, development of the capacity for total destruction, it's a miracle that we've survived. Actual miracle. There's been case after case when total disaster came very close and was averted almost by miracles. In fact, we're approaching one right now with the 
growing serious threats of needless confrontation, likely terminal war in several parts of the globe, off the coast of China, in uh, Eastern Europe, Ukraine. All of these problems we know how to solve, but our moral capacities don't allow us to overcome what our, some of our creative capacities have constructed. Uh, wasn't known in 1975, 1945, uh, wasn't known then, it is known now, that at that point, the human species was entering into a new epoch. In fact, geologists now call it a new epoch in the history of life, of the history of the world, of the universe. The answer is... No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just wondering, I was just wondering if I could come in for a minute there. Could I come in for a minute? Here? Is it possible to come in for a minute here? No. Yeah, yeah, I think you can go for it, Jim. Yeah. It's only I. Uh, I just wanted to to raise a couple of things from what you were saying, Noam. If you can hear me there, okay. I wanted to come in and say a couple of things in terms of what you were saying. One just to do with a uh, uh, language, not some, not language acquisition, but how we know. And one of the features to draw attention to is that. Uh, Matt, the, the, the guy who's chairing, had referred to the, the different areas of uh, knowledge and the different subjects that are referred to within the book. And I, I, I wanted to, 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 to refer to that and also refer to the other thing in terms of how we know that it takes two. It takes two, two people to know things. It takes two in order to have a dialogue and a discussion for us to understand things. So the la so language in that sense, taking what you say about language, but two people are, are necessary in order to, for the language to exist, you know? We're, we're not talking to ourselves, we're talking to one another and how we, how we, we make sense of the world and understand we, we, need, we need people. You know, we need, to, we need people to be able to do these things if we talk about, I, I personally am always wary about arguments to do with uh, the end of the world or the end of mankind because people are people are being killed every day of the week, and they're be, they're being oppressed every day of the week, and in a sense, the issue that we we can also get to from your analysis that is is like how do we struggle against these things that are happening right now? How do we take on these things? How do we take on the state right now? How do we form bonds of solidarity with other with other struggles? You know what I mean? To to take benefit from how other people are, are, are acting in, in ways to try. I mean, I take what you say about uh, where, what, what can happen to end the world. At the same time, as we know, there are people throughout the world who are fighting back right now as we talk. There are areas of, of resistance going on everywhere. You know, the reason the reason that, that things are being stopped is because of state the state maybe actually taking taking pains to do something about it. You know, so that that's that's one of the uh, it's just to just just to raise that raise that side of it, uh, not in, which I, I find it, it's just such a crucial thing that people are aware of, of that sense of solidarity. Where does it come from? Why, why is empathy such a danger to the state? If we go back, Noam, Noam you'll remember in, in the book itself, speaking about, I refer to Socrates and uh, Xenophon, and that idea of uh, the kind of learning that Xenophon had, it's that, that idea that distinguished an Athenian from a Spartan was how the Spartans 
for the Spartan, like armies everywhere, it was the chain of command that mattered. Only the chain of command. The first thing that happens within any army is to destroy empathy. You must have no feeling for your fellow human being. You must only listen to your superior and do as you're told. There is no room for a discretionary measure. All of these things that are part of empathy, are part of solidarity, are the things that the state try and, and get rid of. And, and these are things I, think, I feel that pe people can actually attempt to take that and get that from your work and, and others that, that concentrates on these factors, the kind of thing that a uh, uh, 17th century, 17th century thinkers were they, were, they were trying to deal with these things in face of maybe, uh, the, well, at the beginning of English and British Empire, that that expansionism, uh, you know, the, these these things were, they had a very real effect and have a very real effect in how people try and take on the state. So I feel that that's a, it's a, a really kind of important aspect of it. Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. No, uh, did you you wanted to respond to that? Yeah. Well, let me start with one of the comments in reaction to what you just said, which I was thinking about too. It's from Alicia, who says, "To have empathy is to recognize your neighbor as your family, your equal. That's why it's so threatening to the state." That's actually a virtual definition of what we've been living through for the last 50 years. Uh, it's called technically neoliberalism. It starts with Reagan and Thatcher. Thatcher saying, uh, uh, denying this, she says, there is no society. There is just you and your self-interest, okay? So forget everything else. You alone will survive somehow in the ravages of the market, and there's no solidarity. And she made that very explicit, not just your neighbor, your neighbor, metaphorically. Recall that her first act uh, back 40 years ago was to move to destroy labor unions. That means to destroy solidarity, to destroy the opportunity for people to get together, to work together, with to get ideas together, to understand the world together, and to act with solidarity to achieve the common good. That's the essence of unions, internationally incidentally. So the first thing to do was destroy that, throw people out as atomized individuals uh, with no society. Actually, Thatcher probably didn't know it, but she was paraphrasing Marx, who was in the 19th century, mid 19th century, condemned the autocrats of Europe for trying to turn the population into what he called a sack of potatoes. People who are isolated, atomized, don't know their neighbors, don't talk to their neighbors, but somehow are alone facing concentrated power. That was the ideal. That was what so-called neoliberalism has worked towards. She was, it was mirrored in the United States with different words, but the same ideology and the same consequences. Ronald Reagan's inaugural address, 1981, the central line repeated ever since is government is the problem, not the solution. What does that mean? Government is the one inst general institution which is somewhat responsive to the population, not very much because it's under too much external control from concentrated power, but at least has some degree of accountability. Well, if you take decisions away from 
government, they don't disappear. They move somewhere else to the centers of unaccountable private power. That's where decisions rest. So that's the ideal of what the real definition of neoliberalism is. Brutal, ruthless class war. Place power in the centers of unaccountable uh, institutions. And we know how they operate, how they're supposed to operate. It was told right at the same time by Milton Friedman, the economic guru of neoliberalism, that corporations, that's concentrated economic power, have one responsibility to enrich themselves and nothing else. To become a corporation, be, be incorporated as a gift from the public, you're given all kinds of advantages, but no, no responsibility comes with that. Just enrich yourself and your management. Now, there's an addendum to Thatcher's uh, prescription, no society, which she certainly knew. For the rich and powerful, there's plenty of society. There's a very rich and complex society that works for them. One, in fact, is the government. When Reagan said government is the problem, he or whoever wrote his speeches for him knew very well that that was nonsense. What they meant is we want a rich, a powerful interventionist government which will work in our interest, not in the interests of the general public, not for the common good. So for us, there's rich society, the government, chambers of commerce, trade associations, uh, think tanks, all sorts of rich, complex societies that assist us in carrying out the class war. And uh, you, the victims, the population, you're a sack of potatoes. You don't have any society. You don't have unions. You don't talk to each other. You're just thrown out on the market somehow to survive. If we want to know what's happening, we can go back to Edinburgh and Glasgow in the mid 18th century. Uh, one of my kind of fantasies is to be a space traveler and go back to what I can imagine to be my favorite place, a coffee house in Edinburgh where I could intrude and listen in on a conversation between Adam Smith and David Hume, both of whom believed that sympathy with others is the core of our nature. Actually, in one of his two uses of the word invisible hand, only two relevant ones in his writing, Adam Smith argued that it's if all the wealth of the societies, wealth meant land in those days. So if one rich landowner appropriated all the land for himself, it really wouldn't matter that much because the society would be egalitarian because his sympathy with others would lead him to distribute it in a egalitarian manner because sympathy is with others is so fundamental to our nature. Well, he also understood some other things. In another part of that conversation I'd like to have heard, he wrote in 1776 that the masters of mankind, his word, who were in his day the merchants and manufacturers of England, uh, are, are the principal architects of government policy. They control the government and they make sure that their own interests are peculiarly attended to, no matter how grievous the uh, fate of others under their attack. That's Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism. I wonder whether I wonder whether I could make a, make a point there in terms of that, that that part of what you're saying. When you refer to, when you refer to Thatcher, 
10 years before, Margaret Thatcher made the statement around about 1979 when she came into power. 10 years before that, in 1969, at the end, when Kenya got its uh, independence during the, the end of the colonial period in Africa, the actual army who were there imposing colonial rule in Kenya were basically kind of disbanded and went elsewhere. They spoke at that time to, they came to the States and spoke to people there. At that point in 1969, Edward Heath, and who was regarded as a kind of liberal kind of conservative MP rather than a right winger, he actually asked, how, how is it that we can kill people? How can we kill people? The aim is to kill members of our own society. That was the same point when people who had come from the former colonial part of Africa became the high became in command of the British troops in Northern Ireland. The face, the face of, of policing altered structurally in the UK at that period. Within the space of about six months, they walked in and they, they murdered ordinary civilians in part of Belfast called Bally Murphy. Six months later, they shot dead people in Derry, known as Bloody Sunday. Something like five or six years later, by this time, the guys in charge, uh, they, they, they actually moved back to the mainland and took control before Margaret Thatcher came to power. At this point, people knew the government was basically the managers for the state. I mean, basically the military were writing, were changing how, how the police and the army would operate. They already had murder squads. They already had murder squads formed. They went in and they, I mean, it's, it's, it's far more ruthless. The UK situation, in a sense, is far more ruthless and far, far more dangerous than, than, uh, than, than, than that Thatcher era. Things had changed before that period. They really had altered before then. Um, um, so, yeah, no, sorry, I just want to... We can I see just, that throughout the 70s and going into the way, the way that the, the police were used in battles against the black population. I mean, it was really shocking, these things that happened. 1979, the, the police walked in and murdered Blair Peach at a big anti-racist demonstration in South Hall, Middlesex. There were more than 2,000 police occupied that town, that town, only two weeks before Thatcher came to power. So it's, it's, a, it's really, it's a, maybe a different kind of worms. It's not something to be raising here, perhaps, you know. But anyway. I mean, okay. I think there's a, it's a really interesting point. I mean, I think, you know, what you brought up, Jim, about you know the uh, the army kind of having to drill out empathy in its in its soldiers, and I think you know this idea that kind of neoliberalism stamps out these kind of solidaristic and kind of communal feeling within kind of populations, and and I think that's right. You know, I think if and if you think about if you think about um, you know society as a whole, kind of it sort of encourages. Uh, things like competition and 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 really, you know, kind of uh, encourages sort of individuals to to not just not know their neighbours, but even you know to yeah to be in competition, to be at each other's throats. Um, but yeah, at the same time, you know, empathy still endures. You know, solidarity still endures. Communal kind of feeling and and organising still endures. And I kind of I think that's something. I think that gets raised in the. Um, in the, in the book somewhat that you know there is this kind of will to freedom uh and uh and i think that's been kind of uh, sort of discussed by philosophers uh you know th throughout history and i wonder maybe if if you know either of you guys would like to kind of speak on that that kind of how you see that will to freedom uh either kind of being theorized down the years and and, and also maybe how it, how it plays out humans are complicated creatures 
We have empathy, sympathy, violence, hatred, savagery. It's all part of humans. Which ones come to the fore depends on many different situations, different circumstances. Often we see them at the same time, like this minute. Uh, one of the, the plague, that the, what's in the fore of, the forefront of the minds of many people, rightly, is the pandemic. Notice the different reactions. You go to poor neighborhoods, miserable neighborhoods, like the uh, uh, favelas in uh, Brazil poor, miserable neighborhoods, you can think of many others. There are astonishing cases of empathy, sympathy, and solidarity. People living in utterly miserable conditions who are, uh, uh, who nevertheless under the, who barely, they don't even have running water, have organized themselves to give help to others while the state, of course, does nothing. That's one aspect. We see it all over the world. Plenty of it. If an elderly man is stuck in his home, people bring him food. Uh, people organize soup kitchens on their own, out of their own initiative. That's one aspect of human nature. Then we go to the uh, stately halls and see what's happening. We see that the rich and powerful are monopolizing vaccines for themselves, refusing to break the neoliberal, highly radical anti-market neoliberal principles that provide extreme uh, monopoly rights, monopoly pricing rights to major corporations. So they don't, so for example, Moderna, which now has a couple of new multi-billionaires, had nothing a couple of years ago, thanks to government funding, now refuses to allow its processes of manufacture of the Moderna vaccine to countries like South Africa, which has a, uh, which has a pharmaceutical uh, industry to give them the process. They could be producing the vaccines, which would have prevented very likely prevented the Omicron mutation, which is now spreading over the world. So we have the rich and the powerful sitting in their luxurious suites who are saying, sorry, we have to protect the rights of corporations and keep for monopoly pricing. They've got money coming out of their ears and keep the vaccines for ourselves. And, uh, we, and knowing incidentally in the intellectual corner of their minds that it's suicidal because they're creating not only killing innumerable number of people, but also creating the basis for mutations, which will come back to them. You got that on one side, you have acts of sympathy and solidarity on the other. These are various components of human nature. Actually, you saw them on the streets of Glasgow about a week ago when there were two major events going on called COP26. One was inside the halls where the suits and jackets and ties were talking to each other and trying to figure out ways not to do anything to solve the major crisis in human history that they know how to do it. Uh, and their major decision was to meet next year and maybe say something while the world burns. That was one event. There was another event in the streets where tens of thousands of people, mostly young people, were demonstrating, calling on the wealthy and powerful to do what they, all, what they know how, how to do to overcome the crisis and open the way to, the better, to a better world. Well, that's two aspects of human nature revealed in two different kinds of institutions. One 
the powerful concentrations of capital, concentrations of capital and power, state and private, on the one hand, with their fingers around our throats, strangling us, the other in the streets saying we want to survive. Well, that's human nature is all of those things. Human institutions vary. Which one of these forces will prevail will determine whether there's anything to talk about in the future. You know, Norm, Norm if, if I can come in there, the, the, there's, a, there's just a, a slant in what you're saying I want to, I want to introduce here. You, when you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Marx earlier, and of course Marx, uh, Karl Marx being very influenced by people like Adam Smith and Adam Ferguson, and was very aware, very aware of that train in the Scottish philosophical tradition. But what, one of the things that came out of it, uh, you, you could say, is uh, Marx's humanism, and it's Marx's humanism, humanism that gets missed so often, and 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 his absolute sensitivity to alienation, and the idea that human beings are divorced from their own humanity. Now, part of that kind of filtered, unfortunately, through uh, the labor, the ordinary labor, traditional labor and socialist movement. And I see this as connected to what you're arguing here. The most crucial thing for any trade unionist should always be issues around health and safety. Health and safety is, a, is the most, has been the most crucial issue. And the other one, which is reducing the hours of employment and labor so that people have the chance of becoming full human beings. They know that they will not, they will not have to work in an asbestos factory, for example. They know they will not have to work as they are in parts of Bay, not too far from you are in Texas, uh, where, where people are having to contend with a extraordinary industrial disease and waste right on their doorstep. These issues have been around for like 120, 150 years, and the, the, the traditional labor movement has done nothing to, to support it. They, they have constantly walked away from these issues. So I don't even, I don't see this as a, as a, as a kind of contemporary issue. To me, it's to do with the, uh, you know, it's to, it's to do with the mainstream traditional or establishment left is to do without having a proper critique of of the state, without having a proper critique of government. I mean, people in the, the traditional left wing in the United Kingdom, they have to go into the white into the white wall parliament and say, "God save the Queen," otherwise they'll be thrown out the damn place. I mean, that's how absolutely absurd it is. But these are the people that uh, are controlling. So, in a sense, that I don't even see any. To, to talk about right-wing people in that sense, because the control has been unfortunately kept by people, uh, I wouldn't even call them liberal, they're traditional mainstream left-wing people. They, 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 they walk away from the, the argument anyway. Uh, just, just introducing that point. <laughs> Apologies for the emotion. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's, uh, I think it's a really great, point Jim also because I think now you know because we've kind of we've gone so far down the kind of the neoliberal route we've almost sort of forgotten a lot of the struggles that were had you know between workers and social democracy and you know what you know what was sort of considered to be you know the you know the the what you know the workers and the the trade unions kind of now you know having a, a seat at the bargaining table either with employers through kind of you know forced collective bargaining by the state or you know directly you know with with the state itself i wonder um i wonder do you see um i mean do you maybe do you see that there any sort of um i don't know uh attention that exists within sort of present movements with a kind of an inability to see beyond kind of uh 
you know, social democracy as a possibility, you know, because uh, I, I feel like now when we think about uh, when we think about politics, everything seems to have kind of gotten limited at, um, you know, may, at the most kind of kind of a left laborism or, or something like that. No, but what Norm, Norm was referring, Norm referred to uh, the, the, what you, the big conference that took place in Glasgow. I've forgotten the name of the damn thing. <laughs> but, you know, and there were thousands of young people, mainly young people and people on the traditional left, and not only the traditional, people on the, the radical left who were demonstrating about that. This reminds me of the conference 30 years ago. At the same time that was happening in Glasgow, they were closing down libraries. Why were the why, why was the traditional left? Why were they not demonstrating and protecting outside the libraries that are all they're all being closed down in Glasgow in order to pay for that damn conference? And that's the kind of thing that the blinkers are on that traditional kind of approach to. I mean, I, that's the kind of thing that makes me angry. And it makes me really emotional. Young people will be battered by the police for nothing. For nothing. You know? And the people that should be standing for them, like the Labour Party and those, and the Communist Party, any party that is content to go, for example, with the Labour Party, demands my contempt, and they will get it for these reasons. <laughs> Unions and then there's the Labour Party. Not the same thing. Yeah. At that meeting in Glasgow that you referred to, I presume you recall that uh, it was a great conference of people, mostly unemployed workers, uh, writers, all sorts of people gathering. Uh, fantastic uh, gathering. At the time, I was I had an invitation from a foundation in Scotland, Edinburgh, to give a talk. I think it was called the Scottish National Foundation or some name like that, which was labor supported. They demanded that I withdraw from the from our event conference because I shouldn't because they wouldn't let me have a platform if I was going to be associated with this riffraff. I think that was the late, that was the Labour Party. So of course I told them to get lost, but uh, that's the Labour Party. On the other hand, there are the working people, uh, which is most of the population, uh, who, when they join together, have accomplished a great deal. Social take social democracy. Go back to the 1930s, my childhood. Uh, it was a horrible, the dangerous, desperate situation. The depression was much deeper than anything that's happening now. My family were immigrants, unemployed, working class. Uh, there was a sense of hopefulness and even that of optimism about what we prayed. Why? Because they were in the in the labor movement. My aunts, who were unemployed seamstresses, were in the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which was, first of all, along with much of the rest of the labor movement, reviving from a bitter attack under Woodrow Wilson, which had almost destroyed it. Uh, in the 1930s, began to revive, began to take militant actions. It was much more than, and they made a huge difference. They got to the point of, uh, and with CIO organizing, of moving on to sit-down strikes. That's very serious. That's one step before telling the bosses, we don't need you. We can run this place much better than you can by ourselves. At that point, the business world withdrew its bitter opposition to all New Deal measures. Supreme Court stopped uh, killing every measure that was proposed.
suppose, and they recognize we better take notice, we better do something before they take the next step. And you get a kind of accommodation. And the United States introduced a form of social democracy. As soon as they had a chance, the business world started attacking it. The neoliberals or the recent uh, version, but it achieved a lot. And it was duplicated in, in England and continental Europe in the post-war period. It was a kind of a radical democratic uh, sentiment that emerged globally from the Second World War and the Depression. But, the new, but those were major achievements. The labor movement, take my ants again, weren't just let's get a job, let's get a decent wage. It was also cultural activities, uh, educational activities, uh, science, philosophy. These were people, many of whom had barely gone to school, who were discussing uh, the uh, latest uh, concert of the Budapest String Quartet or the Shakespeare play in uh, Central Park or uh, uh, different what different varieties of psychoanalysis. They were involved in high culture with no formal education, very much like the conference we went to. People with little formal education, but discussing the same kind of topics you discuss in a, a seminar at the elite universities. It's not, uh, this is available to everyone. Well, that was the labor movement, not the labor party, the labor yeah. movement. Yeah. Uh, and that can be reconstituted. And you can see how threatening it is. Jeremy Corbyn was making moves to reconstitute, develop a labor party, which would actually be participatory. It would reflect the interests of the participants and it would work for the interests of working people and the general population. And the, you go back to 2017 and look at the, the results then, and they show that there was enormous popular support from them. That aroused real fear in the British establishment across the board. A huge campaign to nip this in the bud before it takes off. Uh, I don't have to go through it. Went all through the media including the liberal media, uh, the labor, the parliamentary labor party, all kind of invented charges and campaigns. We have to destroy this before it takes off. We don't want a move, a popular movement of working people, poor people, which will take over themselves and work for the common good. That's the greatest danger. They have to be left as a stack of potatoes. Uh, we saw that very dramatically in uh, England, and we're seeing it now in the United States as well. It's a constant battle, constant class war by the rich and powerful, by those who called Adam Smith called the masters of men. In Scotland, they would have seen it differently. You know, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been here, here what happened with Jeremy Corbyn was predictable. It was inevitable. There is nothing within Labour Party history that would have allowed that to happen. It wasn't it wasn't possible. It was just kind of foolish. I mean it's, it's not been possible in the Labour Party for like since about nineteen twenty two when the when the radical Clydeside uh, MPs took over. Nothing like that ever been possible. It was put in place at that time. The com both the Communist Party, you could actually say that the Communist Party and the Tory Party destroyed it. There was nothing there. It was gone. It was gone from the term period with Lenin. It was gone from the period when the Labour Party had already given up. They had basically kicking out the ILP. Every time the Labour Party get a left wing movement, they destroy it. That's what that's what the history of the Labour Party is. It's nothing. So uh, anyway. I wonder, Jim, I mean, because, you know, for me, I, I, I think probably I share the same kind of scepticism of the Labour Party that, that you've got. Um, and I wonder if maybe because the, the way that I sort of feel about, you know, the Labour left 
as being maybe the only faction in party politics you know because the labor left sort of see themselves as a kind of the you know as representing the working class whereas every other sort of faction in the labor party and the tory party everywhere but they, they see strong, themselves you know, no no, no but, but in terms getting, of you can't you can't confuse england with no 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 Scotland, wales and ireland I mean, I mean, I, I personally the, don't the think... The Labour well, Party has no presence in the Scottish government worth talking about. There's no point in talking about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, it's just not for, a point for, to talk about for, it. You know, because I, I think I think what you were saying about, you know, the, the problems with the Labour Party going way back, you know, even, you know, to like Ramsay McDonald and all, all of that kind of stuff. No, he was a I think that's guy, right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> But like, I mean, look, let's talk about a better form of uh, left wing that existed in the UK at that time, mm. before the 1920 uh, conference uh, uh, in Moscow. You know, there was a very strong anti-parliamentarian left wing. Mm. You know, people like Willie Gallagher. When John McLean was in prison, there was uh, uh, Arthur McManus, who was uh, the first secretary of the, the CP. The guy was eventually. He was one of the ones who was named in the Zinovi Evaluator and was eventually shot dead in the Kremlin. I mean, there was a very strong left-wing movement at that time. You know, the, the, the Labour Party that was strong in the, the UK at that time is ILP, Independent Labour Party. You know, and at that time, there was even a strong anti-sectarianism, at least in Scotland there was. You would have had anti-parliamentarians standing the same platform uh, as uh, people in the, the former before the CP was formed, the old British uh, Socialist Party. You'd have had them with the SLP, which was James Connolly's party. You know, you'd have had a very strong kind of a, uh, what could you say, left wing that included various denominations. You know, uh, it's a bit similar to what Rome was saying about the the, the different kind of people who were at the conference in 1990, people had come from all over. People had come from like uh, from came from Leningrad. Uh, no one may remember, and some people who were here that uh, Victor Krivulin was here. A, a really what an extraordinary Russian poet, member of the left. He was here. John LaRose was here from the the Black the Appearance Movement down south had led so many anti-racist struggles in the UK. Had Roxy Harris, Gus John was here, who interviewed you know him, you'll remember Gus. Eudine McDonald, who was the foremost left-wing QC in the UK. They were all in government at that time. For that, for the one that Noam's talking about. Hamish Henderson was here, Angus McNichol, Tom Leonard, Alistair Gray. It was so exciting in all these different levels of the left. There was no one dominant group, none. You know, and no one would ever have confused the Labour Party with a with a left wing group. I mean, it's just common knowledge. Every time they have a left wing faction, they dump them. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. Um, so before, just uh, I wanted to let people know that if they want to start sending in questions uh feel free to to do it now and i'll start uh, noting them down um i wanted to uh, actually i wanted to ask a question about that conference um yeah because uh yeah you know um you know i wondered maybe jim if you could talk a little bit about um you know what was the thinking behind that conference um and also, and then, and I guess, Noam, after that, what I'd really like to hear from you is kind of, um, you know, from reading the book, it really, you know, I get the, the feeling there's a real warm kind of correspondence between you and Jim about it. Um, and, you know, I think you describe it at one point as being the most memorable conference that you ever attended. And this, I think you wrote that about 30 years after the conference happened. Um, and, and I wondered, uh, maybe could you kind of maybe speak about, you know, what made it so refreshing and so made it so kind of reinvigorating uh for you so uh, yeah maybe jim if you kind of kick us off and then uh and then yeah. Noam, if you can tell us about your your kind of abiding memories of it well uh, uh, the basic is self-determination 
it was really to do with self-determination of the individual, but mainly to do with the freedom to determine our own existence, whether as a, a uh, whether as a, a group of people, a community. Uh, it was really what people wanted to make it. People came from all different experiences and so on, and uh, it was really just as providing a forum for that type of discussion where people could meet and talk and share and they would hear, they would hear not only Noam himself, they would have access to George Davies. Uh, George Davies and Noam uh, had, had never met before, although they had a very, a, a very good uh, mutual friend, at least one, uh, Harry Bracken I'm talking about, uh, a, a very fine philosopher. So there was, there was so much involved in it. It would be wrong just to see it as like, uh, you know, something that was there with Noam. There were so many disparate voices there. So. Sorry, unable to hear. Okay, Noam, I mean that. Oh, Noam, yeah, I guess for, from you, I guess uh, what I'd really like to hear is, you know, you know, what about the self-determination conference, you know, really sort of, you know, what moved you, you know, I mean, because like you say, you, you passed up this other conference to go to the self-determination conference. Uh, and, and I guess, and you know, in, in your, your letters and your emails to, um, to Jim over the years, you really get uh, a sense of like, uh, that it was a really kind of uh, a, a warming and kind of, uh, you know, yeah, really kind of refreshing event for you, you know, like different from kind of the academic, the more academic kind of circuit that maybe you sometimes uh, seem like you're forced to move in. Um, so I, I wonder if you could maybe talk about what what was so great about it uh, for you. Sorry, I didn't catch the essence of it. Talk about self oh, about the, the, the self-determination conference uh, that you attended uh with with back jim back in back in 1990. Well, well it was as i said it was a great conference a lot of wonderful people uh, interested uh a lot of fun uh yeah. the uh it was uh, ranged from serious discussions often in the pub across the street to uh, uh What's it called? Kaylee, the dancing and singing, yeah. everybody participating. Uh, just a couple of days of real enjoyment with fine people who were in uh, objectively, they would have been described as with without uh, benefits, unemployed, you know. Uh, right, and not far from uh, having any of the amenities of middle class life, but it was a reminded me very much of actually my childhood with uh, my unemployed working class family who were kind of similar, uh, high level of uh, intellectual interests, cultural interests, engagement. Uh, uh, dedication, uh, concern for doing something that would matter, uh, and uh, living the kind of free, independent life that we should aspire to. I thought it was a kind of a model of that. And it, it did, it was very offensive to the uh, uh, establishment, not just foundation that I mentioned. I remember when journalists came, you may remember this, Jim, journalists came from London to figure out what the hell was going on and wanted to set up a press conference somewhere, but instead we just met in a pub and talked informally and so on. They didn't quite make out what was going on. But the, uh, uh, it was an inspiration I even heard Scotch Gaelic for the first time in my life. When they, which, which, so it was, it was fun, enlightening, and an exciting experience. 
and self-determination starts with our own lives, moves up to higher levels, to free oneself from the constraints of the, uh, actually, one of the themes that was brought up in the discussion, forgot by who, maybe by George Davy, maybe by me, was uh, quoting David Hume's uh, first paragraph of his uh, first principles of government, the first modern political science uh, uh, tract. He starts off by saying that uh, he is puzzled by the ease with which the powerful govern the many. Why do the governed accept to be ruled by the powerful? He said, they actually have the power if they take it in their own hands. So the answer to this miracle, he said, has to be imposition of consent from the top, imposition of the idea that we have to submit, that we have to subordinate ourselves to the domination of the powerful. And if you can get people to accept that, then you're free to rule them, to enrich yourself, to oppress them, and so on. But they don't have to accept it. They can break free. And things like that, those several days in Govan were an illustration of uh, 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 how people were freeing themselves from the fetters, social fetters in which they're uh, in ca tied and in ca the cages in which they're kept, well, it shows you can do it. Not easy, uh, and but it can be done. And those that's why civilization has moved forward to some extent through actions and efforts like those. The young people in the streets of Glasgow are another example of it. It's pushing the limits, moving forward, breaking free from the constraints that keep the governed subordinating themselves to the rich and powerful. Let's go back to the sit-down strikes. They were getting close to a fundamental evil of our society, a modern evil, never accepted in the past, that you should subordinate yourself to a master. For 2,000 years, from classical Greece and Rome up to the late 19th century, it was considered a fundamental attack on human rights and human dignity to be with subordinating yourself to a master, what we call having a job. Uh, and uh, working people in England and America bitterly opposed that. You look at the Labour Party, the Labour press was an independent free labor press in the 19th century, bitterly attacked this idea of being subordinate to a master, uh, wanted to recover our rights and dignities as, pe as free people by taking over the institutions in which we work. The slogan was, those who work in the mills should run them. Uh, that's what you're getting close to with sit-down strikes with many other initiatives uh, which strike at the core principle of domination, which was considered a total ab abomination for millennia until it was finally driven into people's heads by the, uh, in the, the cultural institutional power of the Industrial Revolution. But I think it breaks out constantly could move forward be the primary way to move towards a much more just and free world. And uh, the Govan conference was an illustration. Sit down strikes are an illustration. Uh, working, actually taking over factories is an example. The radical farmers in the late 19th century, mostly US, mostly an agricultural country, organized to create what they called a cooperative commonwealth where they would be free from the 
uh, controlled by northeastern bankers and market managers. What's the populist movement, not what's called populism today. Uh, the incipient labor movement, farmers movement, came close to unifying. If they had, be a very different country, a very different world, was blocked by state and corporate violence. That's class war, but it constantly goes on in one form or another. Okay. Um, I wanted to get to some of the questions uh, now. Um, and there was a question from Alicia that I think kind of follows on really nicely from uh, from what Noam was talking talking about just then. Um, you know, when you talk about the various kind of illustrations just now of, uh, you know, different moments which pointed towards, uh, you know, to, towards you know, maybe better futures or better ways of, of running the world. Can you think of any illustrations now which kind of give you hope uh, for, for the future? Um, and also, Alicia wants to know if you're doing anything nice uh, for your birthday. Um, well... My current source of hope is uh, multiple. One is the inspiring uh, sight of poor and oppressed people fighting for their rights against often vicious murderous oppression. You see this all over the world. I've seen it in villages in Southeast Asia, Central America, uh, Middle East, uh, everywhere. Inspiring sight. People are not giving up, suffering much worse than we could think of, but fighting on and sometimes gaining their rights. For time, I could give examples. Actually, the people, young people demonstrating in the streets, streets of Glasgow is another example. People working hard to take the future into their hands to gain their rights to create a much better society. That's inspiring and enough to keep going. Beyond that, there's a very simple point, elementary point. Uh, we have essentially two choices. You can give up hope, help ensure that the worst will happen, or you can grasp the opportunities that exist, and they do exist, and work hard to implement them. Maybe it'll bring about a better world. It's not much of a choice. It's not a hard choice. And when you see people struggling to carry this forward under highly adverse conditions, you understand that to give up hope is just a intolerable luxury for the privilege for people like us who can't accept that. And, and for your birthday, Noam? Uh, I, I, know, I know Alicia also wanted to know if you're doing anything nice for your birthday. Oh, the birthday? Yeah. Well, my wife and I are going to take the day off. It'll be the first day in can't remember how long where it wasn't solid talks, interviews, or other classes all day. So we'll take off with our animals and just enjoy ourselves. How's that? That sounds great. Um, I wanted to follow up with a question uh, from Liam Doherty, um, which sort of, it's about, uh, you know, he's asking, uh, you know, is our creative capacity independent from our moral capacity? So, you know, if creativity gives rise to sincere divergences in political thought, how do we determine what is moral or good? Um, and, you know, I'm throwing that out to, to either one of you uh, there. Well, that's a question that's been asked for at least 2,500 years when we have a record of it, probably long before that. Uh, probably 200,000 years ago. Uh, actually, there are answers. Turns out that along with our common capacity for language and thought, this 
pretty good evidence that there's a common moral moral uh, sentiment, a moral capacity, maybe related to the language capacity. When you do studies with children, cross-cultural studies, turns out that on fundamental issues, they basically see right and wrong pretty much the same way. When you get to specific cases, you know, should we solve this problem this way or that way, you can get divergences, uh, maybe with good reasons, because people are seeing different aspects of things. But if you move to common human nature, there's very super overwhelming conformity. So the way to solve differences is to try to get down to the point of common agreement and work up from there. And you can often solve problems that way. Not all, not all human problems are easily solvable. Uh, life is too complicated for that. But you can make progress. And there has been moral progress, substantial moral progress. You take a look at what life was like in England in the 18th century, or in France, where it was much worse, much poorer country. It's horrifying to read the descriptions of what life is like. But one of the great pleasures was torture of animals. That was fun, great way to, I was just reading a, recently a book about French culture in the 18th century. One of the great delights was what was called the Great Cat Massacre where poor, poor and working people captured all the cats they could find in some area and tortured and massacred them, which was actually a kind of a working out a parable of the way they thought about the masters, the bourgeois. They were too oppressed to revolt against them directly, so they did it symbolically by taking what was precious to them and destroying it and murdering it in a manner so despicable, you can't even think about it. But that was normal life, because life was, as Hobbes put it, nasty, brutish, and short. And the few ways you could relieve yourselves were by episodes of disgraceful, vulgar, savage behavior. That was the norm. Well, it's not the norm today. There are plenty of horrible things, but not that. Okay, so there's progress. Uh, take uh, the United States. Uh, the United States was founded on two horrifying crimes. One was the virtual extermination of the indigenous society. The other was the most vicious system of slavery in human history. It's a large part of the basis for the wealth of England and the United States. Well, at least we don't have that now. There's some progress in overcoming it. Nowhere near enough, but some. So things do get improved in many ways. Let's take the United States 50 years ago, not that long ago. Okay, what was it like? Well, this is, uh, we had, the United States had uh, federal housing. There were, there were federal housing programs for working people and the poor, but they were segregated by law. African Americans couldn't apply. That was by law, not because it went back to the New Deal, not because the liberal uh, con 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 uh, congressional representatives wanted it, but because you couldn't get anything passed unless you satisfied the Southern Democrats, who were bitter, vicious racists, and had extraordinary power. That lasted until the late 60s. Uh, there were anti-miscegenation laws, so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them. There were, literally, there were anti-sodomy laws. They take the status of women. When the American Revolution took place, it took over British common law, Blackstone. Under British common law, women were not persons. They were property. 
the property was owned by the father, transferred to the husband, it was taken over in the United States. Actually, that stayed on the law until 1975. There was progress in women's rights, but women were still not entitled to serve on federal juries or to be treated as persons. Well, that's changed. So there's progress. It's a battle all the way. There's often regression. The neoliberal period is a period of regression. But overall, there's slow progress through constant struggle and refusal to accept the effort of the masters to dominate and control. Okay, that's, that's, these are reasons for optimism. Perfect reasons. I wonder actually, Jim, if you would also like to, to jump in on, you know, what, what gives you hope? Well, uh, well you, you, could say, you could say that uh, since again, since the 1960s, there's been an extraordinary reaction. There's a, a re real major reaction going on. And when we use a word like progress, it's like using a word like evolution, for example, these things, these things are never given, they're never given to people. People fight and die for these. They're not concessions from the state. People actually put themselves on the line for them. That's why these things happen. If we look at the two primary things that have happened to ordinary working class people over this last uh, several decades, it is always to do with the same things, health and safety, and long hours and the conditions of employment. These things are, the way things are right now, are basically worse than they have been since before 1930s. They're actually worse for people. And the, and the actual radical political expression of, of a, a fight against that doesn't exist. I'd like to go on indefinitely but i'm afraid i'm going to have to leave I've got another talk coming up in a couple minutes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah no thanks no yeah cheers for for giving us your time um yeah um and i think we've probably it's probably about time for us to wrap up ourselves yeah. here so um yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to say thank you to well, thank you to to Noam, thank you to Jim for for, for coming, and uh, thanks to everyone for for coming here and participating and giving us uh, some great questions. Um, and yeah, I think that will be us for for this evening. Um, yeah, and hopefully see you guys all soon. Okay, thanks. Okay. All the best, Noam. Good to see you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.